Welcome to Module 10 of the ADRC Dementia Care Training Series. This is the first of two modules that focus on supporting people with serious mental illness who have developed dementia. The development of this module was made possible through support from the ADRC of Oregon and the Older Adult Behavioral Health Initiative. This module follows nine others in this series. The first eight modules focused on dementia in the general adult population, and the ninth focused on people with intellectual disabilities and dementia. If you have not yet viewed these previous modules, you might find it helpful to do so before viewing Module 10 or 11. Serious mental illness refers to people 18 and older and is defined as having, at any time during the past year, a diagnosable mental, behavior, or emotional disorder that causes serious functional impairment that substantially interferes with or limits one or more major life activities. Estimates of adults living with serious mental illness range from about 4 to 6 percent. The impact is disproportionate to their numbers. About a quarter of adults living in homeless shelters have a serious mental illness, and nearly half have a serious mental illness in combination with substance abuse. Billions of dollars are lost every year in potential earnings. People with serious mental illnesses have higher levels of health care costs, including hospitalizations and medical visits. Yet, about 30% of those with a diagnosis of serious mental illness do not receive mental health treatment. Although the gap in mortality rates for those with and without serious mental illness is shrinking, those with the diagnosis live an average of 10 to 25 fewer years than those who do not. In part, this is due to comorbidities and higher rates of suicide. Many mental illnesses and disorders are included under the umbrella term of serious mental illness, including those listed here. In this module, we will focus on bipolar disorder complicated by delirium or dementia. Schizophrenia and dementia is addressed in Module 11. These are two of the most common serious mental illnesses. Misdiagnosis of comorbidities or poorly treated symptoms cause significant distress to the individual with the mental illness and those who support them. These individuals are at high risk for poor quality of life and high rates of disability and mortality. We will tell the story of Carlos, who is 78 and widowed. His son lives across the country. Carlos has lived in his apartment for 10 years. His neighbor called aging services because Carlos has become increasingly agitated and very restless. He is up at all hours and seems disoriented. When asked about his son, he wrings his hands and says that his son is going to take him to the theater, but is late. Other times he is euphoric as he talks about his past with the theater, all the time pacing around the room. Is Carlos having a manic episode, or is something else going on? You will also meet Wilma. She is 89 and lives in a skilled care unit and is on hospice. She is quite a character, joking with staff and beaming when they are present. She's fairly confused and often does not know where she is, but she clearly enjoys spending time with others and participating in bingo, her favorite activity. She has a complicated relationship with her children. Only one of them is involved in her care. Wilma doesn't seem like the same person described by her family. They painted a picture of a woman whose life was chaotic. She spent most of her time either in bed weeping or being the life of the party, talking incessantly and never listening. She had no social boundaries, telling all sorts of intimate details about her life and the lives of her children, much to their distress. In this module, we will use the stories of Carlos and Wilma to explore how people with bipolar disorders experience aging, and how providers from aging services, behavioral health, and the healthcare system can work together to figure out how to provide needed support. Throughout this module, our guides to supporting Carlos and Wilma will be individuals with considerable professional and personal expertise in supporting individuals who are aging with a serious mental illness including those who also have dementia. We will return to Carlos and Wilma in a moment. Bipolar disorder is a brain illness that causes extreme mood swings. These are more intense than the typical ups and downs that most people experience. Over time, those with a bipolar disorder can damage relationships with family, friends, and colleagues. It can disrupt ability to work or maintain normal everyday activities. People with bipolar disorder sometimes engage in dangerous behaviors and are at high risk for suicide. The fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM-5, 
identifies several types of bipolar and related disorders. For this module, we will highlight the two major types, bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorders. People with bipolar disorder cycle between depression and mania. The DSM lists several criteria for a manic episode which present as an abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood. These episodes represent a major change in behavior for the person. The criteria for a manic episode include an inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, a decreased need for sleep, becoming more talkative than usual or seeming to feel pressure to keep talking, having a flight of ideas or feelings of racing thoughts, being distracted easily, such as being drawn to unimportant or irrelevant external stimuli, an increase in goal-directed activity or psychomotor agitation, and finally, excessive involvement in activities that have a high potential for painful consequences. The diagnostic criteria for both bipolar 1 and 2 includes a manic episode which may precede or follow a major depressive episode. Three of the criteria for a manic episode must be present for at least one week, nearly every day of that week, and for most of the day. The same criteria used to diagnose bipolar 1 are used to diagnose bipolar 2. The primary difference between the two levels has to do with the severity of mania. In bipolar 1, symptoms are more severe and result in marked impairment in functioning or relationships with others, or require hospitalization to prevent harm to self or others, or there are psychotic features. A manic episode in bipolar 2 is referred to as hypomania. This episode is somewhat less severe and does not cause marked impairment in functioning or require hospitalization, and there are no psychotic features. Hypomania is marked by noticeable change in mood and can cause significant distress to individuals and those around them. Bipolar 2 is often paired with depression. Manic episodes may precede or follow a depressive episode. DSM-5 criteria for a depressive episode include depressed mood, reduced interest or pleasure, significant weight loss or weight gain, insomnia or sleeping excessively, restlessness or slowed behavior, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or inappropriate guilt, decreased ability to think or concentrate, indecisiveness, and recurrent thoughts of death or suicide or suicide planning or attempt. To be considered a major or severe depressive episode, five or more symptoms must be present over a two-week period, and one of these symptoms must include depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure in life. The symptoms must be severe enough to be noticed and result in difficulties with daily life, including work, social activities, school, and with relationships. The symptoms are not due to any other factors such as substance misuse, medications, or medical condition. About 1.5% of the general population in the United States have diagnoses of bipolar disorder 1 or 2. This works out to an estimated 50,000 individuals in Oregon. You will notice that the prevalence in the older adult population is somewhat lower, between 1.5 and 1%, or approximately 2,000 to 4,000 older Oregonians. The lower prevalence among older adults is due in part to higher mortality rates associated with serious mental illness, and it may also be due to underreporting. Bipolar disorder typically appears in adolescence or in early adulthood. The average onset is 25 years. It is an expensive disorder for the individual, their family, and the healthcare system. Costs associated with bipolar disorder are among the highest for any serious mental illness. Most older adults with bipolar 1 or 2 disorder had their first episode in young adulthood and have aged with the disorder. Although some people do experience a manic episode for the first time after 50 or 65 years of age, this condition is rare and is often related to a history of mood symptoms or other neurological conditions. Very little is known about older adults who live with the disorder, although they do have a shorter life expectancy of about 10 years. As they age, all older adults experience comorbidities, but those with bipolar disorder have higher rates than other older adults. These include higher rates of cardiovascular disease, respiratory disorders, type 2 diabetes, endocrine abnormalities, and obesity. As a result of these medical conditions, 
care and treatment of someone with a bipolar disorder becomes more complicated. This is particularly true for medication management. Compared to younger adults with bipolar disease, older adults have fewer psychiatric comorbidities. When they do occur, they are likely to reflect higher rates of substance abuse, which has likely been present throughout their adulthood. Anxiety disorders are also more common, although many older adults who do not have a bipolar disorder experience anxiety. Cognitive dysfunction is a core feature of bipolar disorder in all age groups. Up to 30% of older adults with bipolar disorder have significant cognitive dysfunction. Research findings are limited and somewhat inconsistent, but areas of dysfunction reported most are executive functioning, verbal learning, memory, and emotion processing. Let's return to Carlos. He has symptoms that are consistent with symptoms associated with a manic episode. He's not sleeping, he's very talkative, and his conversation could be characterized as a flight of ideas. His constant talk at the theater and needing to get there may be thought of as an increase in goal-directed activity. His neighbor does not know whether Carlos has had a history of mental illness. Carlos also has some symptoms consistent with dementia, including poor memory, judgment, reasoning, and changed mood. But dementia is a slowly progressive disease. Are Carlos's symptoms new, or have they been progressing and are just now being noticed? I think people who work with the elderly, um, what they need to understand about bipolar disorder is that often patients are untreated for their lifetime, that many people have been diagnosed with bipolar and manage that through use of other drugs such as alcohol or Valium or whatever, um, or intermittently seek treatment and often don't want to have treatment because being hypomanic, not totally manic, but hypomanic, uh, really makes them feel alive and more creative and more in control um, than their, quote, normal state. So it's difficult once you get to a certain age, just as anybody, um, that you, you want to feel like you're in control of your life. So I think bipolar illness, just like any other aging person, you have to put that in perspective, that that's an extra additional barrier for them. But a lot of them have coped somewhat successfully without treatment on and off. So I think one of the things is, as you age, things just like any other thing, um, the illness flares up and it has to be kind of dealt with in a different way. You just continue to have to work with the patient um, to the best of your ability to get them to understand how it would, might benefit them to have treatment. Understanding serious mental illness in older adults is complicated, particularly when behavioral changes occur. Health care, aging services, and behavioral health service providers all have a part in the detective work to figure out what is going on with a particular person. Well, I think we can't be jumping at manic episode absent some very good, clear history that he is, in fact, a person already diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Uh, while the literature does include some stuff about late onset bipolar or mania, it's exceedingly rare. Uh, Carlos's case is interesting, of course, because it's common that a, a, a worker is going to get a referral like this from a neighbor or even a family member, you know, that uh, Carlos is b exhibiting odd and strange behavior that isn't common to him, you know. And so that's a key right there. If they say, he's not, this is uncommon for Carlos, something's going on, something's different. You know, what provoked this neighbor to call? You know, how unusual is this? Is it, or is it just kind of like him, but just worse? You know, so questioning this neighbor, the reporter, is very important. Uh, she probably has a lot of stuff that she knows and can offer, but isn't aware that she should be telling us that stuff. And, and so she, of course, would be the first person to really be questioning. And, and uh, in, in a way that kind of gets at etiology, not just here's what he's doing today, but what was he yesterday or last month or even three years ago? 
In the case of Carlos, I'd want to know, uh, well, I'd want to have a medical exam done immediately because something that comes on that suddenly does not sound like a manic episode to me. It sounds like there may be a medical cause. Um, many, many older people have um, UTIs often that cause symptoms like this or symptoms like schizophrenia when they don't really have it. So I would certainly want to check that first. If for some reason he had a medical exam and nothing came out of that, then I would want to consult with a psychiatrist. It would be really odd for him to have a um, mania at that age that suddenly, and there could be other medical problems going on. So I would certainly want to check that. Well, as a member of the team assessing Carlos, what I'd want to know, and what are some of the under, other underlying factors that might be associated um, with what's going on? So are there medical conditions? Are there um, infections or um, painful episodes that he's experiencing? Um, but most particularly emphasis on infection. And then we would also want to look at his medication. So what other medications is he taking right now that might be causing um, some of the issues that we're seeing? It takes all of those involved in care to answer these fundamental questions. What are the symptoms? And what is the context in which they are occurring? That is, what else is happening in the environment? Finally, what are the underlying causes of these symptoms? You will have noticed that all of the experts emphasize the importance of a complete medical exam and identify delirium as a condition to rule in or out as a first step. You may recall from Module 7 that delirium is serious. It is a medical emergency. Does Carlos have a delirium? Delirium is characterized by disturbed consciousness, poor environmental awareness, decreased attention, changes in cognition, and perceptual disturbances. Delirium is marked by its sudden onset, over a period of hours or days. Symptoms often fluctuate in a 24-hour period and are often worse at night. Fluctuations occur in alertness, cognition, thinking, perceptions, and emotions. A person with delirium may be hyperactive and present with agitation, restlessness, and hallucinations. Others may be hypoactive and be very sleepy or difficult to arouse. There may also be a mix of these symptoms. Visual illusions, misperceptions, or hallucinations are also common. Delirium is often reversible with treatment. However, identifying delirium early and starting treatment immediately is critical. As described by the experts, delirium can have many causes. The most frequent include infections, falls resulting in head injuries, and medications, although other conditions can be causes. Those with dementia are at high risk for delirium. Risk also increases with physical frailty and age-related changes, such as changes in metabolizing medications. Let's return to Ann Wheeler's exploration of medications as a source of delirium. We would look at um, anticholinergics in particular. So what is his current anticholinergic burden? Even one anticholinergic can cause someone to experience delirium. We would want to look at um, concurrent medications. We would want to look at adverse effects of those medications um, and then streamline as much as possible. By streamlining, um, what I mean is we would want to um, take away any medications that aren't necessary. So if he's being treated with an anticholinergic medication for sleep, are there other things that we can do? So are there non-pharmacologic alternatives to help him sleep rather than, um, let's say, he's taking diphenhydramine? So we would want to make sure that um, we have good hy sleep hygiene rather than using an over-the-counter diphenhydramine product, which is an anticholinergic. Anticholinergic medications are used frequently. They block the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. In the peripheral nervous system, acetylcholine activates muscles. Within the central nervous system, it acts in areas of the brain that control motivation, arousal, and attention. Many medications have anticholinergic properties, including those listed here. The companion guide for this module provides information about some of the common anticholinergic medications in use. With age, anticholinergics have many negative side effects, including delirium and increased risk for or worsening dementia. Aging services contacted the primary care provider who felt that Carlos needed to be seen immediately. Carlos did not have insight or judgment about what was happening to him. Diane Wheeling provides advice for working with someone in this situation. 
So I don't want to really try to explain in detail what I'm doing and why I'm doing that. I'm just going to redirect him in very simple language um, and tell him what he can do uh, rather than what he can't do. So for example, um, it's not good to say, you can't sit here or don't do that, don't pull on that IV line, etc. What you want to say is, here, hold this, or here, sit over here, or I want to talk to you here. A friend of Carlos, with the guidance of the aging services staff and support from Carlos's son, matter-of-factly told Carlos to come with him and took him to the emergency department. The medical exam revealed that Carlos has a delirium. Carlos has been taking Valium, a benzodiazepine, for 12 years to help him sleep. He also has a high anticholinergic burden complicated by increasing frailty. He has lost weight, is less mobile, and his nutrition is marginal. All of these physical changes in combination with normal changes in metabolism led to the sudden onset of delirium. So one of the other things that we would want to look for in his medication record would be use of a benzodiazepine. Um, it's very common for people who are older to be on a benzodiazepine, particularly um, for sleep. So we would want to make sure that we evaluate for that. Benzodiazepines can cause delirium. They can also lead to cognitive impairment. So we would want to make sure that if one of those is on board and is unnecessary at this time, that we find a way to taper and discontinue that medication. Benzodiazepines are a class of medications that depress the central nervous system, particularly the brain. About 5% of the adult population fill prescriptions for benzodiazepines each year. They are frequently prescribed for psychological disorders, especially anxiety and panic, and for mood disorders, including bipolar disorders. They are also used to help people sleep and for seizure disorders. Benzodiazepines have multiple side effects and are considered high-risk drugs. They are particularly dangerous for older adults. Use is linked to higher rates of dementia and other cognitive impairment, reduced mobility leading to falls, and impairment in driving. It appears that long-term use of benzodiazepines with bipolar disorder may be associated with poorer control of symptoms compared to alternative treatments. Benzodiazepines, in combination with other prescriptions, can reduce the effectiveness of those drugs or result in adverse drug effects. This is also true for combination of benzodiazepines with alcohol, over-the-counter medications, and other drugs. People who have used benzodiazepines for a long time develop a physical dependence on the drug. Deaths due to overdoses increased fourfold between 1996 and 2013 and continue to rise for those over 65. Some of the commonly used benzodiazepines are listed in the companion guide for this module. I would say um, in terms of which older adults would be more susceptible to the side effects associated with benzodiazepines, that would be all um, elderly patients over the age of 65 is when we want to start using as low a dose for a shorter period of time as possible. Um, they're going to be considered unnecessary in a lot of older adults, so we would want to look at getting um, rid of them in most cases. So, um, but the other people that are particularly vulnerable would be those that already have an underlying dementia, and so this is only going to make the cognitive impairment worse. Carlos has been admitted to the hospital for delirium. We now turn to ways to support Carlos as the delirium is treated. The longer you're in a delirium, the more um, opportunity you are to have adverse events, falls, um, pulling out medical devices, um, interfering with medical care. Also, you can have post-traumatic stress or have, um, have trauma, psychological or physical trauma from being restrained. Um, and, and there are studies that indicate you can have permanent cognitive changes if you're in a delirious state for a long period of time. And the longer you're in a delirium, often you're not getting adequate sleep you're not being aware of your own needs, such as food and fluids, and you can kind of run yourself to death, so to speak. Before we move on from delirium as a cause for Carlos's symptoms, Glenise McKenzie emphasizes the importance of thinking delirium first. So one of the things I actually love about working with older adults is um, that it's really complex. 
And while that can be like frustrating, it also can be um, very interesting. So the part of the complexity of older adults is that they are, um, their hearts aren't working as well, their lungs aren't working as well, um, they're not as good about getting rid of infection, and all these you know, changes that have happened over time make them really at risk for delirium. And then delirium can look like dementia, it can look like a bipolar, it can look like a bunch of other symptoms, and so if you're not paying attention, you can miss it, which we miss a lot of them in the healthcare system. The doctors miss it, the nurses miss it, the social workers miss it, we miss it. Um, so I think that you know, taking um, the time again to look at the whole picture of the person, history of the person, history of the symptom, how long has this been happening, um, is, is critical. Because the critical part about delirium is that it, it's, it's treatable. I mean, you need to treat whatever's happening because it's, you know, really is really seen as, a, as we say, a medical emergency. Um, there's something medically wrong with this person um, that needs to be treated, and number ones are infections and or, um, you, know, pharma, you know, pharmacology. We're given a new medicine, the medicine's interacting with something, um, but it is causing this person to then have that agitation and or have a bunch of withdrawal, um, but they are suffering. And if you if you talk to someone after they've um, come, you know, been cleared of the delirium, they will really talk about how fearful and how scary it is because they can sense something's very wrong, but they can't, you know, they they need our help, especially when they've got a dementia or a, any kind of a cognitive disorder, to um, figure out what it is that's that's causing that. So I always am, I, I always tell my students, you know, think delirium first, you know, rule out the delirium before you go off on a, oh, maybe it's late onset, del you know, bipolar or late onset schizophrenia. The most common is delirium. So figure that out first before you go on um, to something else with an older adult, especially when they have, um, you know, they already have that um, cognition and behavioral issues that you can kind of like, oh, well, it's probably just a bad day. Um, and so we really need to um, focus on the, what's, what's really wrong with the person. Now, suppose that Carlos did not have a delirium and was in fact having a manic episode. Suppose that his medical history revealed that he did have a history of bipolar 2 and had managed it pretty well by himself most of his life. In fact, many of his acquaintances were not aware of the condition. How can Carlos be supported? If Carlos were having a manic episode, we would want to probably look at what we could do with mood stabilizer medications. Um, we would start at low doses. We would choose uh, medications that wouldn't interfere with other medications or medical conditions that he has. Um, we could look at starting a low-dose lithium. We would want to make sure, however, that he has good renal function, that it wouldn't lead to further cognitive impairment. We could also consider some of the anticonvulsant medications that are commonly used for mood stabilization, such as a valproate or Depakote. Um, again, we'd start at a lower dose and make sure that what we're doing is um, reasonable and with good outcome. If this were a manic episode uh, and not a delirium, first of all, the treatment from a pharmacological perspective would be very similar, it would be an antipsychotic. But one of the things that you would want to do is to try to build some trust with the patient in terms of building on their strengths and, and if you can, if he's able to redirect with you, uh, is to really ask what helps, what has helped you in the past? How have you managed your mania? Can, what has helped you in the past? Um, a lot of times in the acute episode, they're not wanting to talk about that or don't feel that they have a problem, but sometimes that they are able to really reach back into their memory and say, this medicine, or I just need to get some sleep, or I need to rest or whatever. Um, and it's it's often good to align with something that they feel is helpful that you can kind of cling, cling to and provide for them. So um, for example, I do believe sleep is really essential actually for both delirium and mania, but for mania, getting some sleep really helps have the brain rest and heal. And so it's, it's, promoting good sleep hygiene, providing a calm environment, clustering your care, and if a person does finally get to sleep, it's to really negotiate with the rest of the treatment team to not go in and wake them up um, and, and provide them um, and a, a time frame for which to just rest, knowing that they'll, they'll be safe in the environment there.
So usually um, a manic episode takes quite a bit of time to abate. And hopefully the person is out of an emergency department and maybe into an acute psychiatric hospitalization or getting enough rest, having, being supported by others to keep taking their medications and getting extra rest. I think as a person becomes more organized and less manic is to really kind of um, reduce the shame and so really be non-judgmental about what got them to the situation. Sometimes it's not really anything they did or didn't do, but rather their body and their chronic illness taking flaring up, um, just as you would have flare-ups for um, arthritis or other illness, chronic illnesses. And so just being slowly letting the patient uh, regain um, trust in themselves to take care of themselves and um, maybe do their own ADLs, set up the patient to do that uh, on their own, and really reinforce positive self-care. We now return to Wilma. Wilma is an example of someone who suffered from bipolar disorder 1, and although she was not diagnosed until her early 30s, had symptoms that indicated bipolar disorder in her early 20s. She had multiple hospitalizations throughout her adult life, but had many periods of remission when she functioned quite well. When she remained on her medications, she did well, but she said she missed the pleasures associated with mania. What is the association between bipolar disorder and dementia? Evidence is mixed, but those with bipolar disorder appear to be at higher risk for dementia. Combined with the cognitive deficits associated with bipolar disorder, it appears that those with both conditions experience a more rapid decline than people with dementia alone. It is interesting to note that continuous use of lithium, a common mood stabilizer, may reduce the risk for dementia. Recall from previous modules that dementia is a broad term that refers to a group of symptoms. It is a progressive condition that leads to deficits in memory including impairment in short-term memory, ability to learn new things such as new medication or care routines, and an inability to retrieve information. Dementia also affects a person's ability to take care of her or himself. These deficits are seen first in instrumental activities of daily living, or IADLs, and eventually affect the very basic aspects of daily life. Other cognitive changes include impairment in judgment, thinking, reasoning, and problem-solving. Dementia can also lead to changes in mood and or personality. Wilma is a survivor. She was able to live independently and maintain some social relationships throughout most of her middle age. As with many people with a lifelong bipolar disorder, however, her cognitive skills declined throughout her adulthood. She was diagnosed with dementia late in life. She was supported many years in an assisted living community and after a series of falls and complications from congestive heart failure, she was admitted to a nursing home on hospice. A lifetime of bipolar disease is very difficult for the family and friends of those with the disorder. In this next segment, we will hear from Marilyn, whose mother had a bipolar 1 disorder that began in her early 20s. Wilma was modeled after Marilyn's mother. Marilyn will share what it was like to have a parent with bipolar disorder and her role in caring for a mother throughout her life and through the end of her life. So as a child, of course, I didn't know my mother was mentally ill. And she didn't know either. In fact, people didn't talk about mental illness. I grew up in the 50s, early 60s. People didn't talk about mental illness. And maybe we didn't know very much about it at that time. But what I did know was that my mother could be really fun, but oftentimes when I came home from school I found my mother in bed. And although um, she was good about taking care of us as far as having clean clothes and having meals, um, I don't know what that was like for her, but as, as a child um, it seemed there was a lot of chaos. Let me just say that. There was a lot of chaos in our house as I grew up. I remember one time coming home from school and my mother had baked a, a cake. 
and I had a little brother and she was in bed. I came home from school and he had demolished the cake. So there wasn't a lot of supervision as we were growing up. And my mother had four children, were three and four years apart. So the older children, I'm the second oldest, took care of the younger children. So I grew up really fast. My mother's first decomposition happened when my stepfather left her. I was 10 years old. So my mother had four children with three different men. So that sexual promiscuity was a very real part of her bipolar disorder. Um, she was married to my older sister's father, divorced him, got pregnant with me, so I was born out of wedlock. And then she married the man that I call my father when I was six months old and had two children with him. Um, they were married for 10 years, so at 10, he left her. Oh, the divorce was less than amicable. Um, so, I mean, it was a hard and fast decomposition happened over the course of about a year. And so in that time, uh, my father went to court, filed for divorce. My father got temporary custody of these two younger children, and my older sister, who was a teenager, chose to go with him. And I went to court and said I wanted to live with my father, I mean with my mother. And then I went to court and said I wanted to live with my mother at 10. I, I can't believe that's what happened, but it did. And so she and I uh, lived in a little house on the east side of town. She had a job, a minimum wage job, uh, working as a fry cook at the bowling alley, which was fine with me because I got free bowling, but it wasn't all bad. Um, but we were sharing a bed and she wasn't able to sleep some nights and she would just ramble on about things that weren't, it was delusional delusional talking, conspiracies, conspiracies against her by my father. It just happened over time and then, you know, again I was a child so I'm not sure how some of this happened, but she was committed to the Oregon State Hospital. At that point I just went to live with him and his new wife and her daughter and um, after mom was released from the hospital, she moved back from Medford. She never had any visitation with us, no formal visitation at all. Her life was really hard after that, but the good thing about my mother's mental illness was that she responded really well to medications, very low doses of medications. Over the years, she was on all of them probably at one time or another, Thorazine, Lithium, Stelazine, Cyprexa. Um, and as long as she stayed on them, she stayed well. Um, but I do remember my mother saying that she missed the highs. You know, forget about the days in bed, but she missed the highs because my mother, good news, also never self-medicated with drugs or alcohol. She didn't need to. <laughs> she would be the life of a party um, because she was manic some of the time. We now have a picture of Wilma through her adult years from the perspective of a daughter. In her 70s, Wilma moved into an assisted living community. She was willing to move because she had friends there. Her family was relieved because of her increasing inability to manage her medications, recurrence of symptoms, and increasing difficulties with other instrumental activities of daily living. As Wilma requires more care, what do health, social services, and long-term care staff need to know to provide optimal support? So for Wilma, some of the things that I would want the team to know and understand about her care would be um, what medications has she been on in the past? what has worked well for her? What medications is she on currently? Does she have anything that could be potentially contributing to um, symptoms of dementia and cognitive decline? So are there medications that we might need to evaluate and get rid of and at least taper down on dose if at all possible? Um, we would also want to evaluate her current level of pain. Um, pain is going to contribute um, significantly to any sort of neuropsychiatric symptom. So we're going to want to make sure that that's evaluated and make sure that her environment is um, one that's going to care for her well. 
mood stabilizers, um, psychotropic medications in general can have significant impact on medical comorbidity. So we always look at the impact that they can have on blood pressure, on heart rate, um, kidney and liver function, um, and drug interactions that might occur with the medications that are necessary in order to treat those um, conditions. Um, most notably, lithium can have an interaction with certain antihypertensives. So we would want to avoid those and start other ones. So it's just a matter of medication selection and making sure that there aren't drug interactions that are going to impact her overall medical well-being. Well, uh, the question of Wilma, is the impact of the bipolar disease on her uh, current life, but also her life throughout the life course, is important because what, uh, as I read the case study, what it tells me about Wilma is one that she is lovable and has long periods of times where she's essentially normal. And I would think that sometimes that's even without meds, but certainly with. And there are four marriages suggest that she's, uh, you know, a person that you can like and be friends with and, you know, and be with. The fact that her family has remained involved means that indeed that she's had long periods of time of, uh, you know, seeming normalcy. And uh, the family, you know, tries to help when she's depressed and or manic and get burned out. So that suggests that they're probably those go on for a long time before uh, some, you know, intervention changes her status, you know, such as hospitalization. As Marilyn describes, Wilma's bipolar disorder was managed well living in assisted living. As we know, Wilma did have dementia. As in many families, it was difficult for Wilma's family and caregivers to identify a time when they first noticed. The challenges that my mother faced with her mental illness followed her throughout her life. The dementia for me was, was, would be hard for me to pinpoint when that actually happened because she didn't remember things, she didn't listen to me, she had just a non-stop monologue of what was important to her. If I would try to talk to her, she wasn't listening to what I was saying. She was thinking about the next thing that she wanted to say. So um, she would just ramble on. So the cognitive decline, it was hard to separate from her mental illness. Um, she lived in assisted living for five years. And so at that point, she didn't have to remember to fill her prescriptions. She didn't have to remember to take her prescriptions because over the years, if I said, Mom, have you taken your medication? Because I might pick up on, oh, you've been in bed all week, or oh, you're talking really animatedly about something that happened. Um, have you taken your medication? She would just lie to me. Yes, I took them. But when I would go down to Medford to look through her prescriptions before I would bring her up to Portland to stay with me for a couple of weeks. I want to make sure she have all of her medications and I'm looking at a bottle that should have been refilled two weeks ago and she still had 10 tablets left. So she was spotty at best. So when she lived in assisted living, her prescriptions were filled. She took her medications on time. Meals were provided and um, they took good care of her. The end of Wilma's life was similar to that of many older adults living with a chronic illness, although it was complicated by her mental illness and its treatment. Marilyn described what happened after the third serious fall in assisted living. They ended up admitting her and keeping her long enough so she could be discharged into skilled nursing. I don't know what the rules and regulations are, but that's what happened, which was good because assisted living was not able to care for her congestive heart failure adequately at this time. So she was discharged on hospice and I wanted to move her up to Portland. My brother was done. He said he'd taken care of her for 30 years. He, he couldn't do it anymore. And I really couldn't keep driving down to Medford to care for her adequately either. And I wanted to be with her at the end of her life. It was more important to me maybe than it was to her. Um, I'll never know, but that's what happened. It wasn't easy to move her up here because you had to move her from county to county, so there's paperwork. I had to get a court order to let me move her out of the county and became her legal guardian at that point. I moved her into a skilled nursing home here in Portland where she got the very best care. 
and she was also in hospice, so there was that team coming in to see her as well. And it was at that time, uh, around those three falls, where her personality really changed. She stopped talking all of the time. And I don't know that she was listening, but there, there was more quiet time for me to engage with my mother more and to just be at peace with my mother. So when I would go visit her, we could play cards or we could play bingo or we could just sit in the garden. We could go for a walk. She was in a wheelchair at that point. But it was easier for me to be with my mother and to care for my mother. So that was a blessing for me. Um, her quality of life those last seven months was as good as it could get. In this module, we have explored the experience of aging with bipolar disorders or with experiencing symptoms often associated with a bipolar disorder, and how these experiences can be complicated by health status, cognitive decline, and a range of age-related changes. As suggested by Glenice McKenzie, it takes a lot of detective work to figure out what is happening with an individual, including a thorough medical exam, social and medical history, and environmental assessment. In sorting out the causes of symptoms and how to address them, it is important to keep in mind how those symptoms impact function and quality of life. So in my experience, um, working with older adults who have um, dementia um, and psychiatric symptoms, and whether that's from a psychiatric disorder or whether it's um, basically symptoms of the dementia, you know, what I think that's really important as you're, you know, as we're talking about being thinking about what the behavioral issues are and then what that means for the person's function. So sort of from my perspective, regardless of what's causing this symptom or the behavior, <clears throat> the importance for um, thinking about the quality of life for that individual and for the caregivers is really to think about is this um, impacting function? Is there something we can do, should do? Um, has been, you know, sort of then we started in the, all the assessment about what can be potentially happening and what we can do. So that's why I really focus on what the functional level of the person is and then um, how to take care of that symptom that's impacting function. And again, I don't really care what's causing it but from the level of, of improving that person's, you know, function in the day, um, which then improves their quality of life. More people living with bipolar disease are entering old age. They are likely to have more medical comorbidities and greater cognitive impairment than their age peers without a mental illness. Symptoms of manic episodes are often confused with delirium or dementia. Aging services providers need to be knowledgeable about symptoms of bipolar disorder and understand how the disorder is treated and managed. They also need to understand how age-related change and comorbidities can complicate care and treatment of people with bipolar disorders. Finally, aging services providers need not be afraid to serve older adults or people with disabilities who also have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Help is available through older adult behavioral health specialists located throughout Oregon. Contact information is in the companion guide for this module. As the population they serve ages, behavioral health providers also need to be knowledgeable about age-related changes, including the susceptibility of older adults to delirium, the impact on medication management, and the need for increased supports. Mental health providers, especially those in residential care, often can provide ADL support to help people age in place. Aging services can help, and resources can be found through the ADRC. In summary, aging services and behavioral health providers need to partner with each other and with health providers to understand the source of symptoms and work together to obtain needed resources and supports to enhance function and quality of life. When symptoms appear or change significantly, always advocate for a thorough medical evaluation to rule out medical or environmental causes of the symptoms. Finally, it is important to move from a system focused on eligibility to one that gives priority to maximizing function regardless of the source of symptoms. This concludes Module 10. Please copy this link and complete the short feedback form. We want to know your opinions about this module and how to improve programs in the future.
Thank you again for your attention and your support for people with dementia and their families.